Lovely. Right, into it. Kia ora everyone. My name is Faye Johnson and welcome. Um, welcome to this webinar. We're delighted to be working with Emma Burns and David Haynes on presenting this workshop to you, Conversations of Hope, as part of our involvement in the Mental Health Awareness Week. Uh, GROW is based here at Hawke's Bay and we provide um, a range of professional development trainings uh, in all sorts of fields, including mental health. So absolutely thrilled to be working with these two fantastic people on this topic. I'd like to start with a karakia. Um, I'd also like to let you know that we are recording this webinar. So post event, you will be sent a link to our YouTube channel and to our Facebook page, which is where we will load it up too. A kia. Kia hangi. Kia ko, kia tika, kia pono, kia pai, kia tukituki, kia iki, panauku, huia ea, taiki ea. This is asking us and saying for learning to work, for truth and honesty to prevail, for work to be achieved and to be achieved well together. This is our commitment today. And with that, I'd like to pass over to Emma and to David. Thank you. David, you're currently on. Uh, you've got it. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you, Faye. Uh, hi, everyone, and uh, welcome. Um, it's good to see so many people that have come along today. Um, I'll just introduce myself. I'm contrary to what the um, advertisement said, I'm not a Kiwi expert. I'm in Adelaide, in Australia. And, uh, but I did spend all of 2019 in the Bay of Plenty in living in Tupuki and working in uh, Taronga Hospital at uh, Te Whare Miangiangi, the mental health unit there, and also for Toi Oho Mai um, Institute of Tech in Taronga and uh, in Rotorua. So it's nice to be back in New Zealand, even though it's only just on the screen. And uh, hello to everyone. Um, Emma. Hi everyone, um, my name's Emma Burns. I am a psychologist in Hawke's Bay in New Zealand. So previously worked in a lot of different places like mental health and suicide bereavement, currently working uh, primarily with family harm. Um, so really looking forward to being able to share just a little bit about what this approach is uh, and we'll probably as we go through talk about how it's changed our work and uh, for me personally, how it's changed uh, a lot of my life, but pr primarily my enjoyment of my job and my um, love of people, really. I didn't actually, didn't actually say what I do for a living. I, I'm a mental health nurse, and uh, I'm currently working in Adelaide in an emergency department, but also um, uh, I'm the president of the Australasian Solution Focus Association, and... Um, uh, Emma's the vice president, actually. So uh, we have a lot of involvement in solution focus work around uh, Australia and New Zealand. So we're going to get straight into it, I think, uh, Emma. Yeah. Yep. All right. I'll just get some slides. Um, and everyone will receive a copy of the presentation afterwards. So don't panic about screenshotting or trying to write stuff down. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, I guess our challenge today is uh, we're going to talk about uh, solution-focused brief therapy and we're going to try and explain what solution-focused brief therapy is in 30 minutes, which is going to be really, really, really hard. Um, but we're going to do our best. And um, hopefully this is a bit of a taste for you that um, you'll get a bit of interest in uh, what is the approach and how you can use it. And also that, um, you know, even though, uh, you know, Emma and I work in different areas, um, some of the people here on this webinar will be uh, working in clinical areas, some in social areas, maybe some in education. Um, there might be non-clinical people here. And uh, we think this, uh, this approach can be adapted to just about any area where you work and where you live and any time you're dealing with people who want something to be better, basically. So that could be, like Emma mentioned, suicide prevention, could be uh, acute, acute mental health areas like where I work, um, it could be um, in employment and um, you know, team leading and that, any, anything. 
So we hopefully this um, presentation in, in about 30, just over 30 minutes, will give you a bit of a taste to what solution focus approach is and hopefully uh, get a bit of interest from that. And then at the end, we'll tell you where to go uh, if you want more information. Okay. So here's me and my, uh, my client, my patient. It's an old photo of me when I didn't have a beard and I only had four fingers on my hand. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I'm talking to my, to my uh, client. Um, Emma, do you want to tell us a little, well, actually, before I go, normally, uh, if I'm working in the emergency department um, and I'm not doing solution-focused approach, if I'm doing my traditional approach in the emergency department or, or what we would loosely refer to as the medical model, um, I would say to my patient in the emergency department, uh, what brings you here today? And of course that uh, question is an invitation for them to say, <coughs> well, I'm here because I've got this problem. And so inevitably they've come to the emergency department or to the GP clinic or to the mental health or the counseling room or whatever, because they've got a problem. And so from a traditional approach, I would say, all right, let's tell me about it. Okay. So Emma, could you introduce your, we're going to talk about a case that Emma uh, was involved in. So could you introduce the case now, Emma, and then we're going to ask everybody some questions. Sure. So I'm just going to give you a really small amount of information about this case. This is a real true story. Um, of someone I'm still involved with. So all, what I will tell you is that this is a 22 year old male um, of Māori um, descent. So identifies as, uh, as Māori. Uh, I met him in a situation where he had just been arrested for violence. So he's 22 years old, um, not married. He does have a young child. History of drug use, alcohol use, violence, trauma, uh, you name it. Very poor relationship with family. So, uh, yeah, I met him just after he'd been arrested for uh, violence against a partner. Okay, so what we're going to get you to do, I'm going to stop sharing the screen in a moment, but um, I want you to think about your workplace. If you're working in mental health, if you're working in drug and alcohol, social services, wherever you're working. When you've got a person that comes to you and they've got a multitude of problems, there might be um, drug and alcohol issues, it might be social you know, dysfunction, maybe there's some suicidal thoughts, maybe there's just some stress and not coping, maybe there's some mental illness like depression or anxiety. Mm -hmm. And we ask typical questions, uh, typical assessment. So if you think about from the perspective from where you work. Um, if you can go to your uh, go to the uh, chat part on the uh, on the Zoom, and I want you to type in a question that you would typically ask the person from a from a typical assessment perspective. How are you going to find out this information? So uh, start typing away. Don't wait for me to stop. Um, so if you, you just meet this guy, if if he come into your office. Um, and you knew this much about him, he also actually did have some depression and anxiety. What would you want to ask him? What would you be maybe focusing on? Or what, what do you think it would be important to know about him in order to be able to help him? And that could be finding out about his drug and alcohol, could be finding out about his suicide risk, um, could be finding about symptoms and what's stressing him out. What, what sort of questions would you ask? So I want to get about 200 questions up on the uh, Zoom chat. Keep typing away. So what's going on for you? Uh, how do you feel today? Is, it, is there a particular issue at the moment? What are your biggest concerns at the moment? What are your challenges? You can see there are some solution focused mm. people already here. Yeah. I want to know about from a traditional point of view, you know, from a medical model, what are, what are we, uh, 
What do we need to find out about this person? You know what triggered your action? That's an interesting question. Have you plan? There's some great questions in there. There's some questions in there that make me think that I don't have to say anything. We know. might have to steal some of them for our <laughs> own work. <laughs> well, there's some really cool questions. Right, so when, I, when I'm in the emergency department, just as an example, and someone comes in, um, inevitably, they don't come to the emergency department because they're having a good day. They come because they're having a bad day. And um, usually if they're talking to me in the emergency department, they're pretty, they're pretty much having a, a pretty bad day. So from a traditional medical perspective, when we're doing an assessment, we want to ask a lot of questions. And essentially, we're asking questions about what is your problem? And um, from a medical perspective, we want to find out all about their problem in the most minute detail. And it, and it actually gets to the point where I want to know so much about their problems that I'll find problems that they didn't even know existed um, because I'll find out so much detail about their actual problem. So, for example, if someone was depressed, I want to ask about what their sleeping patterns are like, what's their appetite like, What's their libido like? What's their energy levels like? You know, and they're going to say, oh, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. I'm going to ask about what's stressing them. And I'm going to ask about all the little things that are stressing them. They're, they're going to give me a list of 20 things, wife, kids, work, money, housing, all of these things that are stressing them. And if I'm going to do a suicide assessment, I'm going to ask about how they're feeling, have they got any plans for suicide, what sort of plans have they got, have they tried it before, have they practiced it, um, you know, do they have the means to access all these, uh, these things that they're thinking about. We're going to paint a really, really big picture about uh, all of the things that are going wrong uh, in their life. I'm going to go back to the slides. Um, solution focused therapy is not like that. We're going to, we're going to ask different questions. And uh, that's what we want to explain today about uh, the approach that we would use. So to do that, um, I'm just going to read this quote from Alcoholics Anonymous. It says, when I focus on what's good today, I have a good day. And when I focus on what's bad, I have a bad day. If I focus on the problem, the problem increases. If I focus on the answer, the answer increases. So for me, even though this is not a solution focused therapy book, this sums up a lot about uh, what the approach is. So when I'm in an emergency department and someone says to me that they've got a problem which is this big and they can't contain it, and I ask them 50 to 100 questions about explaining what the problem is, what do you think happens to their problem? After I've finished 50 questions, 100 questions, suddenly their problem is this big or this big or this big because I'll find problems that they weren't even looking at. So when I focus on what's bad, I have a bad day. When I focus on the problem, the problem's going to increase. But when I focus on the answer, the answer increases. So that's and what we're think, going to do for solution. Can you think problem. about the fact that, you know, this, this presentation is called Conversations That Create Hope. You can, it's easy to see that when we, when we focus on what's going wrong for people, when we focus on what their challenges are and how difficult life is, we're not helping them feel hopeful or confident or optimistic. And so we want to be asking people questions that increase their hope and help them feel like, um, despite how difficult things are, that they can get through their challenges and their problems. And so and that's right. And a big part of the hope is to be able to see things that they can't see. So when they come in to see me, for example, they are focused so much on their problem that they can't see their way through it. And we want to try to open that vision up a little bit so they can see things that they can't see. Um, and uh, hopefully by focusing on the answer, then the answer will get bigger as we go through it. So to explain what is solution-focused brief therapy, we thought the easiest thing was to show you a couple of videos and uh, then get you to think about 
from the video, what is solution-focused brief therapy? Now, the first one comes from a movie. And uh, hopefully you know this movie, Patch Adams. Um, this first scene, there's no sound in this video uh, because uh, the only clip I've got is in Spanish. So I'll turn the sound down, I'm gonna tell you. This is at the very start of the movie when um, Hunter Adams, um, Robin Williams' character, is just admitted to an old fashioned psychiatric unit. I think it's in 1960 something. And uh, he's just getting shown around. And uh, I'll just talk through it. This fellow named Arthur comes up to him, scares the life out of him. Arthur's a, uh, a bit manic. And he says to Robin Williams' character, how many fingers am I holding up? And uh, Hunter says, four, you got four fingers. And he says, basically, he says, no, you're an idiot. You know, and walks off. So that's the, the before bit. The next clip I'm going to show you, hopefully this one has got sound. I'm just going to just double check my sound's turned up, sorry. Which it hasn't. I'll do that again. Hunter fingers. Okay, so hopefully this is loud enough and it all works. Place one tablet in front of another, and we'll see where you have a problem. Of course, if there were a news story covering this event, the headline might read, Small Brain Enters Room. Fingers. What's the answer? Oh, there's another one of those bright young fellows who always know the right answer. Right? Welcome to real life. Okay, no, wait, hang on. Did everybody, uh, I'm hoping that people could hear that. Um, yeah, Faye's nodding ahead. Okay, hopefully. Um, if I was going to explain what is solution-focused brief therapy in a couple of minutes, I would use that clip. So what I want you to do is I want you to think about what it is from that clip which would explain to you what is solution-focused approach. 
So I want you to think about that in your head. I want to leave it in your head for a minute. I'm going to show you another video. Uh, this is a very different one. And this also explains a bit about what is solution focused therapy. So I want you to, it only goes about one and a half minutes. I want you to watch the video. And then what we're going to do after that, we're going to go into uh, uh, breakout rooms. Um, Faye will divide us up into rooms. And uh, I want you to have a little discussion about uh, what it is from those two videos that you're going to speculate what is solution focused brief therapy or solution focused approaches from these videos. Here's the second video. This is Bill O'Hanlon Bill O'Hanlon from the US. And uh, he's talking about a conversation that he had with a fellow named Milton Erickson, who is his uh, teacher and, and mentor. And uh, a lot of our ideas about solution focused approach comes from Milton Erickson. So have, have a listen to uh, his story. And one day he told me this story about when he was growing up in the uh, rural area of Wisconsin. He and some friends were playing in one of the farms and a horse ran in with his rain tall skew and had obviously thrown its rider. And uh, the boys caught the horse, calmed it down, headed it a little, and the horse was not calm, but nobody knew whose horse it was. And Erickson said, I'm gonna take this horse back to its owner. His friend said, how are you gonna do that? We don't even know whose horse this is. He said, that's all right, the horse man. He jumped on the horse and steered it out onto the road and he spurred it off. The horse started trotting down the road. It turned right when he went onto the road. And he spurred it on and went down the road. Every once in a while, would stop and want to eat some grass on the side of the road. And Erickson would just steer him back on the road and keep him moving. About five miles, which was a long distance in those days in the rural area of Wisconsin, the horse pulled in, turned a left, and pulled into a farmyard. And the farmer came out. He obviously heard the horse coming in and said, there's my horse. He said, he threw me a while ago. How did you know to bring the horse here? I've never met you before. And Erickson said, I didn't know. The horse knew. All I did was keep him on the road and keep him moving. And that for me was a seminal story about... A seminal story about something to do with... And oh, wait, wait. <laughs> so, thinking about the two videos that you've uh, just seen, I want you to have a think about what is solution focused brief therapy. What, what things do you get from those videos? Uh, so we're going to break out into uh, small groups for about, uh, I don't know, we've only got about six or seven minutes, I guess. Mm. And um, what does that take us up to about half past? Uh, about yes. Yep. Yep, yep. So it's 1.23 now. So um, I will create the rooms. And um, yeah, there's about five people per, per room, thereabouts. Um, so yeah, I'll open all rooms right now. Is that all good, Emma? Yep. Oh. Yep, 
we've got, um, I'm just, there's a couple of people who haven't joined, so I'm just doing a little bit of a re, re jiggle, moving some people. That's all good. Someone's written in the chat to say that they're already in a group of people. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So, uh, join. That's fine. Forty-five minutes is not long, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Well, I can always um, broadcast a message so that people within the rooms can see, hey, we're going to give you a couple minutes longer. So you, you just... Well, I don't want to give them too much longer because uh, we won't have any time left. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So even if, the, if there are five people in a room and even if they don't all say yeah. something, that's... As long as they get a couple of ideas around mm. what it is. I said, yeah, people seem to be shuffling around a little bit, so I'm just managing that. To, um, most rooms have um at least four um i've got one room with two people because a couple of, uh, a couple of rooms now with two people but that's okay that's... they've had others but that have um left the room so it's all good solution rather than the yeah and so it's helping the person find the solution for themselves absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah someone else please put not approaching with the obvious response that's it's definitely true i think it's about you know doing what people aren't expecting and certainly my experience of this approach is people are quite surprised by the questions they ask because they we ask because they're quite different to what they have been asked before. Not, Not having, having to, to come, come yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's such a takes a lot of pressure off you as a professional too, having to fix things or find someone's answers for them. We we might call that a not knowing stance. Um, we'll go into the room. Sometimes, if I'm using a traditional approach, the answer might seem so bleeding obvious that I just want to blurt it out. But it's, that would be my answer, not not their answer. And I want I want them to come up with an answer. But sometimes their answer is going to be so different, but it will work for them. Anyone else? We've got a minute, about a minute or less before everyone else comes back. So, does anyone else make a quick comment about the clips, what they got from it? Oh, I'd certainly say that it made me think. You know, um, um, I've written in the chat. Somebody had asked a, a question. You know, about um, the the barriers. You know, what are people's barriers? You know, what do they identify as their barriers? And then after watching the first video, I was thinking, wow, that's that's totally the wrong way to go about it. You're right, we should be looking at the solutions because all that would do is asking them to list the barriers in their life is make that that so much bigger. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. All about taking that, that focus away. Yeah. Like it, like it. Hmm. Yeah, so right, right. we're at 131. So how about I close the breakout rooms and bring everybody back? Sounds good. Yeah. Great. 
I'll close all rooms and they'll get notification that it's closing in 57 seconds. I think Colette must be an expert because looking at, she's put, looking from another angle through a different lens, the person is the expert and the solution is within them. Yeah. I think Colette might have seen my slides, which there's a quote coming up. I think Colette should be taking the session. <laughs> Like wonderful feedback. Brilliant, yeah. How are we going, Faye? Is everyone back? Uh, yes, they are, they are coming back in now. So um, we've just got 14 seconds left. There we go. And everybody is now back with us. Great. Cool. All right, so if we had more time, like all day, we would love to hear what you talked about in your in your groups. And I'm really, really, really sorry that we've only got 45 minutes. Um, but hopefully you've had some discussions about what those, what, what little things you might have picked up from those uh, videos and hopefully we'll show at the end, uh, we'll, we'll be able to talk about that uh, in a few minutes when we get to the end. So I'm just gonna go back to the slides. And looking from the comments, um, people have definitely picked up a lot of the key um, principles, I guess, of the approach. Emma. This is a, uh, I'm, anyone who knows me in real life knows that I'm mad about quotes. Uh, and this is one I really like, and I think it's a really nice fit with this approach. And simply says the answers you get depend upon the questions you ask. And I know certainly from my experience of, of learning this approach and uh, coming from a background of asking very problem focused questions and the usual questions in the traditional model to, to this approach, uh, when you ask different questions, you get really different answers. And not only that, you get a whole a really different engagement, um, a different relationship that you build with that client uh, and a lot of hope. And it's not just about making, giving hope to the person who's struggling. When we ask these questions and have these conversations with people, we become, as professionals, become more optimistic and hopeful and I said at the beginning, you know, when I learned this way of working, it really gave me a renewed excitement and enthusiasm for my work. And I think that is simply because it's a different way of engaging and we're having very different kinds of conversations that bring hope into the room. Absolutely. So it's whether you're asking a problem focused question, the problem's going to get bigger. But if I'm asking a what do you want instead sort of question, future orientated question, we're gonna get a very, very different answer. I think it's really important to, to comment that it's, this is not about pretending that problems don't exist or minimizing them or um, denying that they're there or, or not allowing people to talk about these struggles. It's, it's very much not about that. We still hear people's concerns, but it's about how we help people move forward is by moving beyond that into their hopes. Uh, and their aspirations. So anyone that knows me will know that uh, if I'm going to use a quote, I'll quote Milton Erickson, and this is one of my favourites. Um, yes, bad things happen to people, and people do have a lot of things in the past um, that they may want to talk about, sure, but uh, we can't come into a therapy type or into a relationship, we can't uh, change the past. But um, we could maybe do something now. We could talk about reorientating a person to a, to a better future. Uh, so that's what we look at. Okay, so Emma's gonna go back to the uh, case and um, talk about what she did. But I love hearing Emma's story. She's got so many stories. Uh -huh. Again, if we had all day, uh, we don't. Um, okay, for them. Tell us a bit more, <laughs> Emma. Okay, it's interesting coming off the back of that last slide actually about not changing people's past because 
when I met this young man, and as often happens when I'm talking to people in a similar situation where they've been arrested and I have access to looking at all the previous times they've been arrested, um, this young man said to me, have you looked at my history, was the first thing he said to me. And I said, no, I haven't. And I deliberately don't look at people's histories because I, I can't go back in time. And I said to him, well, I, we can't go back and change your history. Um, I can't go back and change it. And personally, I actually don't want to know someone's history because I want to meet them as a person, um, independent of their problem or their challenge and find out about who they are in their entirety, um, not just the particular thing that's brought them into, into contact with me. So I asked him, my very first question to him actually was, uh, it was in the police cells, so unusual kind of uh, environment. Obviously people can't come to me because they're locked in. So my first question to him was, what, um, what would you like to be different when you go home? If, if things could be different when you leave here, what would that look like? And what support do you think you might need to get there? And so it was very open-ended, very vague, and deliberately vague, because I'm, I'm sure if I'd said to him, I'm here to talk about what you've done wrong or why you're in here, he would have probably been a lot less keen and enthusiastic about having the conversation. And so we went into a different room and, and spoke about about him as a person. I asked him about what his aspirations were for the future. I asked him questions like, you know, if I was to bump into you six months from now and you were telling me that life was really good and things were going well, what would be happening? And I asked him what, you know, what he enjoys in life, what he's good at. Um, it had been, it had been probably six or seven months since he had last uh, interacted with police and so I asked him you know how he'd managed to do that how have you managed to uh, not not be in here for for such a long period and so it was a completely different conversation than if we'd talked about um, what what he'd done wrong the night before his history what was wrong with him um, per se and it was it was amazing and when I watched that video that David showed with Patch Adams I, I get quite emotional when I when I talk about cases and when I look at that video because when you see that connection in that video with Patch and um, Hunter, is it? Uh, and Arthur. Arthur. Hmm. Okay, well, whoever. Um, and you see that moment where they connect. And I think these kind of questions and talking to someone as a person, uh, not as someone who's done something wrong or has a particular problem, you really do experience that amazing connection with them. And that is the beginning of creating a lot of hope. If I'd spoken to this guy 10 years ago, uh, it would have been a very different conversation, assuming he'd even agreed to talk to me at all. And it was a great conversation. I found out so much about him. I found out what he, his hopes were for the future, what was important to him, how he'd managed to keep out of trouble, so to speak, for such a long time. Um, and also what some of the, the challenges were for him. He felt that if he had got particular kinds of help, would help him move even closer towards a future that he wanted. And, and the beautiful thing, I think, was he, it was all coming from him. I wasn't telling him, you know, we need to talk about your drinking problem or your drug use or your violence. He was talking about what was important to him, what his goals were, um, how he'd managed to get so far already, and what he saw as the next small steps towards him having that future that he wants and that he, he is capable of having. That's kind of in a nutshell, the summary of, not the exact questions, but the, the flavor of the conversation. Well, we've only got five minutes left, Emma, officially, so we're gonna keep pushing on. This is your favourite slide, Emmy. So you should yeah, it's one of my favourite slides. Not my favourite favourite, but so if you think about the two different ways we can think or we can look at problems or situations, the the top model that we've talked about um, as the traditional model is very much a focus on the problem. You know, what's going wrong? Uh, how long has it been going on for? How bad is it? How does it affect the person? Uh, and all the detail. And so it's very much about 
looking for deficits, looking for problems, looking for things that need to be fixed, which, um, David, often when you talk about this slide, you, you say this is a really good way of thinking if your car breaks down and you need an expert to come in and tell you what exactly has gone wrong, why your car's not starting. And in that situation, we want to know the problem. We don't really, if our car's not starting, it doesn't matter if we've got new tires, the car's not going to be going. Whereas the bottom line is we still acknowledge that there's a problem. Like I said, it's not about minimizing or denying or, or wearing rose-colored glasses. It's about acknowledging, yes, there is a problem. But instead of putting that under the microscope, we ask people simply questions like, you know, what do you want instead? How, how would you like your life to be instead? If, if the problem is uh, experiencing violence, so if, what would you like instead? How would you like your family to be instead? And then opening up a conversation around what that instead looks like. Uh, and there's lots of questions um, we ask in particular ways we engage in that conversation and um, the, the skills and the tools behind that, which we're not gonna get to today. Uh, but it's it's a very, uh, very, what would you say, probably, I don't know the right word, but it's a way of having a conversation where you are very gently orienting the person towards the future that they want. And the, the questions that we ask, the things that we choose to respond to, uh, because it's as much about listening, if not more, about actually listening to a person than, than responding. So we'd listen really carefully for um, glimmers of hope and whether that is progress a person's already made or signs of strengths and details about the future that they want. And that is what we build the conversation around. So we might talk about um, someone's preferred future. Um, we might talk about uh, when someone is the the best version of themselves that they can be, what would that look like? So uh, I'm going to shoot through, I'm just going to read these quickly. One, one advantage of this type of perspective is that it tends to change the nature of what one finds in our clients. Simply stated, if one studies only problems, one finds only problems. So I think Emma talked about that. We, we would change the questions we ask, we're going to change what we find out about our, our clients. We're going to find out about their strengths and their resources and what they would want instead. And I think, you know, by the time I, I meet someone, they've, uh, to use a metaphor, I guess, they've, they've already possibly had a very, very long walk down a very, you know, a, a corridor full of problems. And that could be weeks, that could be months, that could be years, it could be almost their whole life where they feel like they're walking down this dark hall just filled with problems. And so my, my job when I talk to someone is that when they finish the conversation, they don't go back into that really dark problem saturated hallway they actually leave the conversation metaphorically speaking through like a, a door of hope um because if i'm sending them back out into their problem focused darkness i'm not really helping them and and i'll be going with them and i'd rather take them through a doorway to hope and a really uh, encouraging future that they want all right, so we've got only about a minute to go, Emma, or less. So I'm going to no shoot through rambling. these because I'm not going to read everything out because you'll get a copy of it. So we'll have to read it for your homework. Um, so we've got some poor ideas about what is solution-focused approaches here. So uh, again, if we had more time, we'd talk about it. Um, but that's for next time when we come back. Okay, so I'm, I apologise about that. And so, you will get the slides so you yeah. can um, have a look at this. Okay, uh, and so next, I just want to, before we finish, just want to uh, briefly mention uh, Emma and I are involved with the Solution Focused Association, which is uh, in Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, and uh, members from a few other places too. There's our website. We encourage you to come and uh, have a look at our website and uh, link in with us uh, if you'd like to know a little bit more about what we're up to. I'm also going to mention the Journal of uh, Solution Focused Practices. This is something that we've uh, been working on for the last two years to try and rebuild. Uh, it used to be this Journal of Solution Focused Brief Therapy, which has been changed. So we'll send you those details and um, it's now available for free. So we can uh, get it through, we, we're publishing now through the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. 
and there's a free resource and all of our back issues are also being put onto the same website. So our, our links for that are there. Um, upcoming, we're going to put a bit of a plug for our uh, full day workshop that we're going to do in November from 9 to 3.30. So a bit of a plug on for that one. You can see all those details on the Grow website. And uh, we've also put a plug for our friend, uh, John Hendon, who uh, I think John presented at one of these lunchtime workshops. Mm. Uh, Monday, Monday evening, yeah. That's right, on Monday evening. Um, yeah. Absolutely brilliant, yeah. So he's yeah, we're, we're good friends of John and uh, he's doing these workshops in uh, November. There's another one in February, I think, uh, next year. That's, that's right, yes, yeah. yeah. So yeah. we'd encourage you to have a look at that, think about that one as well. And uh, there's our contact details as well. So I know that uh, there's probably been a few questions asked in the chat and we haven't had an opportunity to answer them. But if you'd like to email your question to Emma and she'll be really happy to answer that. I knew you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought oh, of the God. view, David. <laughs> but we do have, uh, I think, I don't know how much time you've got, Faye, but we do have time to stick around for a little bit. Great. Well, then, um, yeah, that's a great opportunity, everybody. If you would like to ask questions via the chat, you can do so, or you can unmute yourself now. And um, please, you know, do ask the question. I will also share in the information uh, that I'll be sending out the uh, details of the workshops coming up that David and Emma just talked about. So, um, yeah, very excited. And thank you so much for your participation here today. We've really appreciated it. So let's open the floor. Does anybody have any questions that um, perhaps we missed uh, in the earlier chat or that you'd like to unmute and um, share? Uh, palliative care here in, in Christchurch, we'd just like to say thank you very much for a, a really excellent um, overview um, and we have to go back and see patients. So we thank you and goodbye. Namihi, thank you. Bye, Namihi. Thanks. Great. And perhaps if I scroll through some of the questions. Ah, now um, we have had a good question come in from uh, Mike. Is there a relationship between the solution focused approach and motivational interviewing? It's interesting. Uh I hear that a lot. People talk about, often people will talk when they learn a bit about solution focused, either will see its similarity to either motivational interviewing or narrative. Um, I think there are, I've certainly got some colleagues, um, David, you know, David Prescott in um, the States is very keen on motivational interviewing. That would be his primary model, but also likes uh, solution focused. I, I did do some motivational interviewing training before I learned solution focused, but only very, very limited. It was like a two day training. So I'm no expert on MI. Um, but I think there is some similarities. Uh, but I think probably for me, again, with very limited knowledge of MI is that the solution focused is very much uh, more focused on the client being the expert and uh, them taking the lead, them much more future focused and the, 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 the solution's not necessarily related to the problem. So a, a person's preferred future um, is not necessarily just the absence of the problem. If I think about people who are violent uh, or live in a situation where there's violence, their preferred future is not simply the absence of violence. It's the presence of strong, family relationships and enjoying each other's company and having fun together, as well as all the other individual aspirations that family members may have. So, I uh, know, David, are you much familiar with MI or there might be other, there might be experts in here on MI who might like to comment? I'm, I'm not an expert at all, uh, but um, my, my limited understanding um, for motivational interviewing, we're looking at uh, weighing up the differences or the options in the future between um, options of if I continue to do this the way I'm doing it uh, compared with the options of doing it a different way. And um, whereas in a solution focused approach, we wouldn't necessarily be looking at 
what happens if this problem continues the way that it is. We're looking at the better option, what would people prefer? But that's my limited um, understanding. Um, I, I can see a question here about the, is there a pre from Frederic and Anne Marie, is there a preferred way to see the lost horse metaphor? No, there's not. But uh, if you look at the video and I'll, if you, even if you email me and I'll, if you can't find the video on YouTube, I'll send you the link. Uh, Bill O'Hanlon actually describes what it means for him, um, but I'll cut that bit off. But um, I think Emma said it was about um, giving people the opportunity to find their way. And, uh, you know, when, like you said, when the horse went off the road a little bit, we sort of nudged it back in the direction of the road and it kept walking. Um, but uh, the person knew which direction that they wanted to go into. And that's, but there's a few other things, I guess. There's another really cool video on YouTube. Uh, I don't know if it's what in Bill's collection, but where Milton Erickson talks about the African violet queen. Uh, there's, if you just Google Mil Milton Erickson African violet, it's a really, really cool story. Cool. Perhaps I can include the link and the information that I've seen through. Yeah, yeah. I'll make sure you've got all the right links. I'll, I'll do that. I'll give you that. Uh, I just oh, see there's a question nice. about um, people with severe depression who aren't very responsive. Um, yeah, definitely. I, I've worked with a lot of people who uh, would be, have been termed as severely depressed uh, or similarly uh, people who are termed resistant to help of any description. Like I certainly, with the work I do with uh, family harm offenders, often they come to me uh, with the label of resistant to change or unmotivated to change. And I think my experience is that these kind of questions are focusing on what a person wants, um, the times when the depression maybe is, is maybe a little bit more in the background so that it's not saying it's gone altogether, but they're feeling a little tiny bit less depressed. So we talk, we have tools within the approach that we talk about, you know, the, how strong, strongly present a, a problem might be and there's days when if you think of like a scale when the depression might be really 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 strong and other days when the, the depression is not quite so strong and so we're focusing on those days and what's different and also asking them questions around you know honoring their strength and their resources like you know even though you you struggle so much with this really really debilitating depression that might feel like it's overwhelming how how you still manage to get out of bed? How do you manage to still, whatever they're doing, go to work, uh, look after your kids? And so acknowledging that even though the situation is really, really challenging and really difficult, trying to focus in on the person's coping and the strength um, and how they keep going through difficult times. And obviously really similar for people who struggle with suicidal thinking, um, how we help them move past those really dark, times where people feel quite hopeless and you know the best antidote to hopelessness is hope and so hence this approach I think is really really powerful because it brings hope to often what seems to a person and can seem to us as professionals is quite hopeless or very very minimal amount of hope. Uh, when you say Cara um severe depression who aren't very responsive. I mean, it's hard if, if someone's severe in terms of catatonic depression or something, or if that's hard. Um, it might, it, it depends on the context where you are. If you're in a therapy room or clinic, it might be different to an inpatient unit. Um, but uh, it might be, for my, for my perspective, where introducing a lot of ideas, we're introducing hope, we're introducing that someone will get through it, and it might be little snippets that we do over a period of a few days. Um, we Not necessarily in a, in a therapy room where we've only got 45 minutes and we're going to bang it out now and suddenly you're cured. Uh, it might be that over, the, over a period of a few days we're building on hope, we're building on less look at what's what's it going to be like when you get through this might take time 
Um, Hina, I haven't specifically used the approach with people on the autistic spectrum. David, have you? Not specifically, but all I say is that uh, there, it is used around the world. Um, yeah, there's people definitely with, people who work in that field with this approach. Yeah, intellectual impairments and, and also with children as well of, of a very young age. Um, I only see people with over 18 in my job though. And I see children as well as, as adults. So, and it's great with kids because you have a lot of fun using it with kids, with using kids' as imaginations and their creative streak that they have. So it's heaps of fun, really cool. Um, Joanna, with the burnout, uh, mm. I don't have it anymore. I used to, I'm not, not that I ever was burnt out, but I certainly used to, this is a bit embarrassing to say this, but I used to have clients that I would go to do a home visit for and I would knock on the door and quite honestly hope that they weren't home. And that was nothing about them. It, was no, it wasn't anything critical about them. It was everything about me because I knew that I, didn't, I wasn't making a difference. I wasn't being helpful. And there's nothing worse when you go into a helping profession. You don't join a helping profession to be unhelpful. And so when you, when you see people and you come away and you think, I, I don't think I made a difference, that's really horrible. And I don't have that now. I know that even some of the really challenging cases I have where there's you know, lots of issues and lots of violence and what you might see as a really difficult case that a lot of people wouldn't want to even work with. I, I know that when I visit them and talk with them, it's going to be a positive conversation and there's going to be... Uh, inspiration and hope. Um, I'm inspired by the families I work with because I see people coming through some really tough situations and you just get to know them in, in a different way and I mean if there's an opposite of burnout I think that's what this approach has given me um, an excitement and an enthusiasm I and mean, it's I think it, I've heard it said before you, it's, it's like vicarious happiness um, that you get from the work that you do because you see these people um, making amazing progress and all the credit goes to them. We just, we just ask them the question. They are, um, they're solving their own problems and, and um, forging their own path forward. And it's really quite an honor to be part of it, to be honest. Yeah, I'd say that's similar, Joanna. Um, I've worked in emergency departments almost 20 years and that's the, uh, 20 years of uh, listening to people's problems and analyzing people's problems. And um, when I learned the solution focused approach, the first time that I learned it, uh, first time I practiced it on anybody, I thought, oh, I'll just give it a go. Nothing. There was a woman that had been coming in frequently to the uh, emergency department with chronic pain issues and a whole lot of, uh, whole lot of other problems. And uh, I'd seen her a few times. And I, the only way I could describe her was like, she was like a black hole where all of the energy in the room would get sucked into this big black hole. And after talking to her for an hour, I just felt completely drained because it was just problem after problem after problem and nothing was moving it. And this went on for weeks. And uh, I tried using this and um, uh, I won't go into detail, but uh, we had such an amazing conversation when I asked her some different questions. And at the end of it, she actually stood up and she, for the first time ever, she stood up, she shook my hand and she initiated her own discharge. She said, thank you very much. I better call my husband. I'm, he's going to pick me up now. And at the end of it, I went back to my office and I sat down and instead of feeling completely drained, like I normally would talking to this woman, I felt good. And uh, I felt rejuvenated. I felt like there was something positive happened there. And um, that's just one example, but it, it rejuvenated my career to the point where I could keep working in the emergency department. And uh, if I can spend a little bit of time doing this during the day on one or two people, um, I feel a lot better and, and uh, I know that uh, my, my patients here will as well. That, that's awesome, Emma and David. You know, thank you so much for sharing your personal stories. That really, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's inspiring to hear the passion in your voice about what you now do and the difference that you're making. Um, just fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And I guess with that, we're now past two o'clock. 
So um, we'd better have a wrap up. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. We really enjoyed you being here and your participation and your questions. Uh, as we've said, we'll be sending out the slides and the information on the upcoming workshops and uh, as well as information on the uh, association, the Solution Focused Approach Association that Emma and David are a part of, the Australasian. And um, yeah, just what a fantastic webinar. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon. We'll be in touch. Lovely. Bye. Lovely. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Cool. Right. Oh. I'll go through it. I'll just